It's Song Talk Radio with Michael, Neil, Phil, and the gang. Welcome to Song Talk Radio. This is a show with songwriters talking to other songwriters about the craft of songwriting. We share tips, tools, and techniques, and together we all become better at writing songs. I'm your host, Neil Modi, and today is May the 4th, so may the 4th be with you, everybody, whichever galaxy you're listening from. I am wearing my favorite Star Wars t-shirt. Ah. Just for the show today, for our viewers on YouTube. So if you're not on YouTube, check us out on YouTube and you'll see that. <laughs> and with me are the members of the Song Talk Radio Action Team, of course, from a galaxy far, far away. We have Force Be With You, Phil. <laughs> the Force is strong with that one. Yes, it is. And we have Millennium Falcon Mike. Ah, I wondered if I'd get Mandalorian Mike or not. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll take Millennium Falcon. Millennium yes. Falcon works. Because I'm swift. And fairly creaky and old. <laughs> Can you do that uh, run in, in three parsecs? You know, parsecs are not a measure of speed. They're a measure of something else. Oh, so, that's, uh, no. So that's just really, no. That's really going to relate to our theme today. So hold that. Uh, hold that. That's oh, good point. <laughs> yes. I'd just like to point out that um, nothing in, in Star Wars actually happened. It's all, it's all made up. So It happened. It just was a long, long time ago. So we've forgotten. <laughs> That's true. No, it happened, but it just happened in a movie. Ah, that's it. <laughs> Movies are real. So they are very much. In case anyone's forgotten, this is a show about songwriting. <laughs> um, please send your comments and questions to at Song Talk Radio on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, or feedback at songtalk.ca for the email, and we'll share your thoughts on the show. And Mike has left us. Where is he going? Okay. I just thought. I'll, I'll move the empty wine bottle. <laughs> That's always a good thing. Again, guys, YouTube, come on. You can't see these antics without the YouTube. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Please visit us at songtalk.ca to find out how you can be a guest. And uh, before we get to tonight's uh, guest for our special theme show, a um, couple of little uh, updates and things. Uh, Phil, with today's funny. Uh, yes. Yeah, so we were talking about NFTs last week, and it is a an odd and confusing subject. And mm -hmm. uh, I came across what I thought to be a very, a somewhat funny, but I think quite um accurate uh, explanation of what NFTs are. And I have no idea where this is from. So if you're out there, um, I'll give you what kind of uh, credit I can. Uh, someone in some forum, and it's not a forum I recognize, um, called it. Jacob uh, Galapagos, uh, wrote, uh, I don't know what an NFT is. And I'm too afraid to ask. And someone uh, with the name of uh, Chris Simeus uh, uh, wrote, imagine if you went up to the Mona Lisa and you were like, I'd like to own this. And someone nearby went, give me $65 million and I'll burn down an unspecified amount of the Amazon rainforest in order to give you this receipt of your purchase. So you pay them and they went, here's your receipt. Thank you for your purchase. It went to an unmarked supply closet in the back of the museum and posted a handmade label inside it uh, behind the brooms that said Mona Lisa currently owned by Japalagos. Um, so if anyone wants to know who owns it, they'd have to find this specific closet in, the, closet in the, this specific hallway and look behind the correct brooms. And you went, can I take this Mona Lisa home now? And they went, oh God, no. Are you stupid? You only bought the receipt that says you own it. You didn't actually buy the Mona Lisa itself. You can't take the real Mona Lisa home, you idiot. You can take this, though, and give you a replica print in a cardboard tube that's sold in the gift shop. Also, the person selling you the receipt of purchase has at no point in time ever owned the Mona Lisa. Unfortunately, if this doesn't really make sense or even seem like any logical person would be happy about this exchange, then you've understood it perfectly. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was kind of accurate. It, that's really what it is. You're buying a receipt. And I don't even know if there's any central location where one can browse these NFTs. So No, I don't think so. I think the whole point to the whole cryptocurrency thing is... is we're not engaging with centralized banking systems. We are decentralized as the whole internet is. And yeah. 
so I, I don't know if there's a if there's a central repository. I, I don't imagine there is. So how does anyone know that anyone owns anything? I suppose. It's yeah. a good question. I do, I do like the point about burning down unspecified portion of the Amazon because the, the things that I've read about this is like cryptocurrency, especially like it actually takes up like it's got a huge carbon footprint. You think it's all it digital, it's just computers, but they take up an enormous amount of, of power to computing power. Yeah, computing power to mine. Oh, these okay. Things. That's what I wondered. How it's all virtual. How can it use up rainforests? But yeah. uh, I see the, the electricity to power these uh, non fungible yes. tokens. Yes. <laughs> takes a lot of takes a lot of energy, I guess. Okay, hmm. and uh, what else we got? Oh yeah, so a couple of weeks ago, of course that that, that was in, uh, that was a reference to our um, show last week with Eric Alper, where we talked about NFTs and went deep on that. Non fungible so tokens. Non fungible <laughs> tokens. <laughs> in case yeah. we're not clear, um, so definitely check that episode out. And uh, the week before that, we did um, an episode on giving tips on using your digital audio workstations or your DAWs software at home. And um, as a follow up to that episode, um, I decided to do a YouTube video on specific tips for using the DAW that I use, which is Cakewalk by BandLab. And I put together a video with demonstration demonstrating on screen how I do a couple of things and just a couple of like some of the quirky things about Cakewalk that you may not know about <laughs> and um, sort of things that I learned, you know, after you learn the basics about just like arming tracks and recording and things like that, you know, the sort of things that make you scratch your head and go, why does it work like that? Okay, but now that you know, you can kind of <laughs> work it better. So um, so we'll put a link to that um, in our show notes as well. Yeah, it's worth checking out. I, I yeah. watched a little bit of it and... Uh... I will learn more soon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As Mike is quickly becoming a Cakewalk user. <laughs> exactly. I'm trying to port back and forth between Cakewalk and Logic. So at some point, I may become knowledgeable on one of them, or at least knowledgeable <laughs> about the transfer between the two. Yeah, that's that's can be tricky. The thing with and, all these uh, DAWs is they are so deep and they have so many features that you know, it really would take you years of constant using it to learn every feature. Um, yeah. You know, so it's just and, you got to... But the best way to learn it is to make songs on yes. it because yeah. to do it theoretically and I'll learn this, all this so that someday I'll need yeah. to, is too hard. Like you have a song, you want to record it, figure it out and you do it piece by piece and mm -hmm. process of elimination and you talk to friends who have the same... Uh, same DAW, and, and that's, I think, the, the best way to, to learn is by just using it. It's just by using it, and especially, like, you we always want to think of it in, in musical terms. Like, I've, I've hit a wall. I I've, I've can't do what I want to do. I can't express myself creatively in a certain way, so is there, is there a better tool for me to do this? And, and you go forward on, on that basis as opposed to let me learn every feature, and then I may or may not use most of them. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Don't forget about them. Yeah. And uh, uh, Maestro Fresh West, Canadian uh, rap legend, has yeah. uh, released a new children's book. Um, who's got What's some info on that? <laughs> Nobody? <laughs> oh, I thought you did, Neil. Uh, I, I, I heard about it on the radio and uh, um, yeah, I don't know a lot about it, but... Um, <laughs> Well, There's if, you, can, if, you, if you can, mind. if you can just fill time, I'll be able to find out something well, about I it in to seconds. Mention something that Here I we go. Been... It's called yeah. "Stick to Your Vision." Stick to your vision, right? Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, really cool. I yeah. did have one thing I wanted to add. I had a bit of a epiphany the other uh, day. Oh, nice! Is I've been doing more uh, vocal recording, and mm. um, I have this. Uh, it's a cheap Apex mic that I I got a kit from. I think uh, microphonekits.com or something. And it has like a, a Neumann um, cartridge and you replaced all the electronics in that. And then I sort of rebuilt it. And it's, you know, it's not Neumann, but it's better than what it was. So I've been recording a lot of vocals and I sort of thought, gee, it'd be kind of nice to have like a, one of those vocal channels, you know, that has a, you know, a compressor and a really nice EQ and, you know, uh, you know, so you know, gives it some nice flavor. And I started kind of looking into them and, you know, didn't want to spend too much money. And then I was downstairs uh, after talking with some friends and I was downstairs looking at 
my equipment and I realized I actually have an analog channel. I have I have a Behringer compressor, which isn't the best compressor, but it's okay. And I have a, a Yamaha mixer, which is, you know, not a greatest mixer in the world, but it's it's an analog um, channel. And um, I've actually been using that. And it actually does sound better than just using the uh, microphone straight. So I think it's so easy to go out and buy some equipment and get caught up in the, oh, I need this or I need that. And very often you actually already have the stuff if you use a bit more imagination. And I still maintain it's better to learn what you have than mm -hmm. go out and buy more equipment. Absolutely. See, that's the attitude that it results in us not having any sponsors for that's our show. <laughs> unless, you see, unless, unless they're a sponsor, at which point you should buy two. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Just in case, because they're so good. That's true. <laughs> so, yeah. So we hardly endorse, insert sponsor name here, because they're great. <laughs> they're great. <laughs> we, we endorse knowledge more than anything else. That's, that's true. Yeah. Uh, before we get to our, our guest and tons of knowledge, I just want to mention that uh, there's a new uh, video out. Uh, in 2004, uh, Prince, among others, was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and the direct and the uh, final song was uh, Tom Petty and Jeff Lynne, Stevie Winwood and Prince, and a few others playing "While My Guitar Gently Weeps." Uh, the director of that show has recut it because Prince does a fantastic guitar solo at the end. Uh, and so it's been recut, so it's all on Prince, and it's just a fantastic piece of music history. So yeah. look it up. It's, it's, on, it's on the YouTube mm. and easy to find, but it's well, really yeah, worth we'll watching. To, we'll include a link to that as well in our, in our show notes. And, and Prince was always notorious for, like, vaulting a lot of his stuff. He just tucked it away, yeah. and no one oh, would God, ever yeah. see it. So yeah, there's an album coming out soon if it's not already out. There's going to be oh. one coming out probably every year. But yeah, his estate has released an album of his. Oh, okay. I always think it's neat the... to realize he lived in Toronto. Yeah. Yeah. Bridal Path. Well, he was, he was married to someone. He was married to a woman from Toronto. Yes. He could have come on yes. our show. Could have. You know, all he had to do was fill out the form, but he never wanted mm. to. Uh, I think that's <laughs> what it was. Me. <laughs> he just I think, I think he predated our show. He might have. Yeah. He might have. Um, and just a final um, note, congratulations once again to one of our favorite guests, Julian Taylor, who has now been nominated uh, for the Canadian Music Week Indie Awards uh, for his latest oh, okay. album. So congrats, Julian Taylor. He's just racking up these award nominations. <laughs> Very we should get him back fellow. on the show. Yes, yes indeed. Before it gets too big for us, uh -huh. <laughs> forget well, the we've, we've had Gra we've had Grammy winners and Juno winners. I'm sure he'll still come. Back. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I'll take the time out. And speaking about time out uh, today, we're very happy to have the return of Matthew Reed, a Toronto-based award-winning composer for film, television, games, and theater, including the comedic musical *The Second City Guide to the Symphony*. Welcome back to Song Talk Radio, Matt. Hello. Greetings. <laughs> How are you? Reverend Matt. Great to have you back, Matt. <laughs> Good to be back. It's been a while. Father Matt. It's been a while. So we nice. are and you have been busy. Yes. Yeah. So we are, we're going to be picking up on uh, Matt's deep musical brain uh, tonight as a composer. Oh. And uh, we're because we're going to dive deep on the controversy around tuning standards. Are you oh. a 440 hertz person or do you play to your own tune at 432 hertz? Uh, we're here to make sense of all the madness, and hopefully we'll bring an end to this controversy once and for all. We will solve it tonight. Oh, yeah, and then we'll do <laughs> peace in the Middle East. That's right. Wait a minute. I think I think the only reason we're doing this is because it's May the 4th, isn't it? It's, it's just the play on words, May the 4-4. Four, four. Oh, yep. be with you. Oh. May, May the 4th okay. be with you. Okay, I took your joke, maybe. It was a, it was a perfect 4th. <laughs> I guess it is. <laughs> so what we're getting into is, what is it? The, the, uh, the scale, the standard by which music is is it's tuned, tuned. Okay. Or, or reference pitch yeah. yeah so the idea was as uh, i'll just give you a little brief and then we'll get into it so as early as 1885 and thanks to alan cross for this information uh <laughs> the music commission of the italian government declared that all instruments and orchestras should use a tuning fork that vibrated at 440 hertz 
which was different than the original standard, which was 435, and different than the competing standard 432 used in France. <laughs> oh, those French. And then in uh, 1917, the American Federation of Music endorsed the Italian idea. And then in, uh, 19, in the 1940s, there was a further push for it. And by 1953, a worldwide agreement was signed. Signatories declared that the middle eight, the middle A on the piano would be forevermore tuned to exactly 440 hertz, and this frequency became the standard. But there are others that think that perhaps uh, 432 is more organic and has better spiritual harmony for you. All right, have at it, folks. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, the, the, the way that I see this, it's a really interesting discussion, but um, if, you, if you adopt the relativist view of nature and figure that everything is relative to one another, then the, the whole notion of having an absolute universal pitch is complete bumpkiss, right? Because, because most of us, those of us who don't have perfect pitch anyway, most of us experience music on a <laughs> uh, on, on a relative scale, like we experience intervals. If someone just plays a note for you, you don't know offhand without the reference of another note, whether that's been tuned to 440 or 432 or 428 or 450, whatever, um, unless you have the reference of another note. So, you know, the whole, the whole idea about there being this universal, um, you know, perfect one, Somehow doesn't doesn't fit with that uh, with, with that worldview. One would, well, I one think they mean it's to, like if you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Matt. I, I was going to have to say one would have to have to have to double blind test the the effects on on thousands of people with with certain frequencies to see if indeed there was some sort of therapeutic quality to 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 a tuning or not. Right. And it would have to be it would have to be blindfolded and and, and, and even I mean preferably uh, it could be devious. In, in the fact that you might play tune 432 and say this is for, this is tuned to 8440 mm -hmm. and, and and to see how, if one might be biased against it merely by saying it was 440 versus 432 um it would be remarkable to test such such a hypothesis and especially um i mean the the, the theories are very a priori, aren't they? They, they? There's there's no empiric real empiricism behind it. No, there's no science behind it. It's just, uh, it tends to be... It's, well, it's rationalized field, with, with numbers. They say 440 is for thinking and 432 is for feeling. Right. <laughs> Hendrix, Hendrix, Jimi Hendrix used 432, and um, uh, Goebbels, uh, the Nazi, used 440. I, so I'm not trying to sway you one way or the other. <laughs> mm -hmm. now, this is what, this is what we're told. So this, what is, I was this, is like the, this is like the choice between cigarettes. Would you smoke his brand? Would, yes. would you so smoke what? Hitler's cigarettes? So what I was <laughs> no, told... Not that, again. No, never again. So anyways, what I was told um, about this tuning standards was that um, it was that originally the what was considered to be A was actually much lower. But um, when you tune an orchestra up it sounds brighter and a little bit more attractive and that's why the tuning kept on going up now that's what you know my music teacher in, in high school told us so i don't know how true that is but that's one theory yeah. I suppose. it's kind of became the case it's sort of it's parallels in the loudness war of, of, yeah. of cd recordings um if you have if you have an instrument which has certain physical capabilities the more pressure you put on it that will that will trap like the stretching of a, of a string, you can you can hear that, or or uh, more easy to to tell the a voice as it gets higher. You can you can hear that strain, or yeah. uh, which is not necessarily the, the the best sound. Obviously, there's limitations, so there's there's a, a law of diminishing returns. So you're finding that sweet point between brightness and and pain, or or destroying the instrument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there is some truth to that. There was a thing called pitch inflation in Europe, at least that that orchestra started tuning higher and higher, and for that reason, that it sounds brighter, right? Yeah. So if, if you were to hear a song at 440 and then hear exactly the same song at 432, the 432 would in fact sound warmer, just by by virtue of you heard a brighter version a minute a second ago, and now you're hearing a slightly detuned version, so it's going to sound a little bit a little bit warmer, right? 
um, I think the issue that they ran into, like I think I think in England or or maybe it was France, they actually tuned as high as like four, almost four fifty, um, and that put. I mean, instruments can be tuned higher easily enough, but the physiology of the human body doesn't change. So singers, opera singers had to strain their voices a lot higher. So they kept right. raising it and lowering it and trying to establish a standard because before, you know, uh, countries started communicating with each other uh, on a mass scale, um, you know, every, everyone had their own pitch standard from town to town, from village to village, from country to country. Within so, within the same uh, within the same town, sometimes there could be within the same town, sometimes you know, right? different neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 my like, understanding like, is like, that, uh, like my sorry? understanding is that the 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 biggest shift happened when Americans started producing instruments tuned mm. to four forty that got exported worldwide, voila. And then four forty becomes right. the standards because right. your instruments are tuned that way That's by right. default. So what is the what is this uh, controversy between 440 and 432? Why do people want to change it? I don't think or anyone wants to change it. They just believe that it's better. Okay, but why do they believe it's better? Uh, because it's warmer, more organic, and it taps into your subconscious and makes you feel a certain way. That is nope. what, what they what they what that that's what the. Uh, advocates for 432 say yeah. that it's it's uh, ha it is more harmonious with nature it is uh, and it affects you more emotionally whereas 440 is more rigid and, and affects you more intellectually as Matt pointed out no way to prove that but mm -hmm. a lot of popular musicians I've mentioned Hendrix but the Beatles a lot have recorded in 432 oh, so, really? oh yeah you can you, it's 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 strange hearing. Uh, it, was, it was particularly strange hearing the Beatles, and 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 you know they're 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 a little low because they're, mm. they're they're between they're 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 not they're never in key they're a little bit. So is that is that most of the Beatles songs or some of them or all of them? Um, I, I I I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but uh, what was I hmm. what was I listening what, what, to? What, uh, was that due to them tuning down, or was that due to them playing with? tape and slowing things down because when you because back in the analog days when you slowed something down you also dropped the pitch you couldn't for do sure it. that's a that's a good question so um yeah were they were they tuning or, or was it uh, an after effect of the technology uh i've also found out that someone is saying that the frequency should be 528 because it's oh. a digital bio-holographic uh, precipitation, crystalline, and miraculous manifestation of d uh, diving frequency vibrations, which I have no idea what that means. All right. <laughs> oh, man. I, have I not said that over and over again? <laughs> I know. I didn't want to mention it because it's just like, oh, Michael B. Arby. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the other question here is, is we're talking about hertz. Now, Yes. Who, who, who even knows what hertz means? It's a, it's a frequency. Right, it's it's cycles per second. Per second, right. which which depends on the arbitrary definition of a second. Exactly. Of how we're how we're measuring time. How do you so every, measure everything second? everything could change if if we decided that a second was actually ten parts of an hour or 12, 12 parts of an hour. So that would mm -hmm. completely change the math. Yeah, and and of course this one YouTuber that I, that I follow, Adam Neely, is a classically trained musician. Hmm. Um, he he did a whole video on this thing and actually did, did and actually defined or found the scientific definition of a second and it has to do with some radiation of a cesium atom or something like that like right. it, it's a really it's a really it's a really ob obscure little scientific definition that has like this enormous number and you actually crunch the math on it and divide it by 440 and divide it by 432 and of course you end up with these like really arbitrary numbers. And it's like, well, how is one more meaningful than the <laughs> other? We don't, yeah. you can't see it. <laughs> well, and, and particularly since we, I mean, with our tunings, we, we fudge the numbers anyway, like our tuning, there's so many different tuning systems in order to, uh, and our, our even tempered system that we use now where all the scales are considered equal. You, you, play mm -hmm. a, you play a C major scale, you play an F sharp major scale uh, if you don't have perfect pitch and you're and you're given time, they're gonna they're gonna sound pretty much the same. They're not gonna really have their own quality. Some people may say say otherwise, but mm -hmm. they're they're gonna sound pretty much the same. Um, 
Well, where, I, where heard, I, I heard that thing like D minor is the saddest yeah, key. Yeah, of course. They, they certainly, I, the keys certainly sound different to me. Well, here's here's the thing. Back, I mean, back in a different time when we used different tuning systems, they, these uh, these keys would actually have, have sounded a lot more different from each other because of, of the way we tune so, on a, so on a you, fixed so pitch the interval, like a, the intervals between notes were different? Is that what you're saying? That's correct. So if you play okay. in it, you'd have to... If playing your harpsichord, you'd have to, or your, your virtual or whatever, you'd have to tune it different ways if you wanted, if you wanted to play an F sharp uh, major, God forbid, you'd have to completely retune your uh, your keyboard uh, well, because that's... because some intervals would be just uh, would would sound unbearable. Ah. And that's why Bach wrote the even even tempered cl uh, clavier clavier clavier. He was clavier? he was demonst he was demonstrating a, a, a one of the. Uh, forms of tuning, yeah. and there and there were many even even in box day there were many people uh, floating ideas around, including his pupils and, and his contemporaries, uh, mm -hmm. Ramo and Kernberger. Yeah. So more it's... modern instruments like the saxophone are tuned to four forty. So any song that has a saxophone on it is likely to be in four forty or uh, a Fender Rhodes piano or a Hammond organ or mm. so more modern instruments are tuned to the standards so they would be in 440. They say that Rubber Soul was recorded in 432 but it's mm -hmm. more likely that the tape has stretched mm -hmm. and the same with others. <laughs> Do you think so. it, uh, certainly, it certainly sounds strange and it's it's impossible to play with unless on a piano unless you no, playing with an electronic piano, and you can and you can tune down on the fly. Tune down, yeah. Was yeah. that so? You don't think that was on purpose? It was just a the tape medium, as as Mike said. Yeah, well, that's yeah. fascinating. Uh, they that's say that Bob Marley often used it, but I think that that's more likely because he recorded in Jamaica, where power was not consistent at one twenty or whatever. Like the electrical power fluctuated. So I think uh, that, again, that had more to do with it than any, any kind of conscious decision, because I think they did have electric piano on some songs, which would negate mm -hmm. having uh, 432. Has mm -hmm. anyone here sort of uh, researched and, and listened to all these various different um, audio samples out there? <laughs> we don't do research for the <laughs> show, Phil. Get In terms of... <laughs> A A A B A B playing. Well, like and one. again, here, here, here's the problem with A being is that you're hearing it immediately after you hear the other version. So yeah, it's going to sound different. And 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 yeah. from my perspective, what it sounds like is if you start with something in 440 and then you immediately play it in 432, what it sounds like is oh, 432 is is flat. Yeah. And vice versa, if you start with four 432 and then they play with 440, oh, now, yeah. it's, now it sounds sharp. It's it's a it's a weird contextual thing. Uh, it's it's way it's the way even people with perfect sorry Phil um, even people with perfect without perfect pitch when they are are very intimate with a song that they know yeah they can they can sing it in in key in the key of, of the recording even though they don't have perfect pitch and they can tell oh that's that sounds off that's it sounds off yeah that's too, that's too fast that's too high that's too low. Uh, and that's that's what what's happened when I did some some A/B testing uh, earlier this week. Yeah, and and for like for the first like if you listen to something at four forty and then four thirty two for the first little bit of the four thirty two you're like whoa this is like really out of key, but mm -hmm. as the piece progresses you get accustomed to that mm -hmm. new tuning and okay Correct. it sounds yeah. right now. Then if you go back to the four forty again oh this is way sharp like what's going yeah. on here. But then as time progresses within a few like within a minute probably less than that even. Within a few measures, you probably get more attuned to that that new reference pitch. And okay, this sounds right now. Yeah, you just let yourself go, man. Yeah. So one of the arguments for four thirty two, as far as I understand it, is that they feel that it divides up more evenly in the various frequencies, like the divisions of the octave and the semitones. Yeah, and the quarter eighths and sixteenths. Yeah that it's more divisible, but I'm not sure how that would affect, because most sound we hear is made up of tons of overtones, and I think the yeah. overtones are often very co complex in and of themselves. Yeah. So. And, and again, you're, you're dealing with numbers that are based on an arbitrary number of, of what, a, what the definition of a second is. So, like, The second is based on a decay of atoms. 
Yeah. Which is so fixed. like, and, and, and it's, and it's some like astronomically large number. Like it's like the numbers don't line up with anything. You know, they only line up because we we decided that 440 is a nice round number, 432 is a nice round number, but yeah. there's nothing universally true about that. It's just no, and and, and there never there never had been before. Uh, I mean, in, in Beethoven's time, I mean his his A was uh like four four fifty something, it was even higher. Mm -hmm. And and not and not too much earlier ha handles and he, he couldn't was, even hear what he was doing so how was he supposed to know? <laughs> hey yeah it was an, it was a tuning fork in his mind that's yeah. right <laughs> eventually have you, have you um explored any other um tuning uh, uh systems in your in your work or do you I've, I've never really done i've never done it i've never done it myself but I've, i'm becoming uh more interested in it and i know other people i uh i, I know have, have have played with these tuning systems mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, th I think part, part of the takeaway here is if you want to try it and go to 432 or 428 or anything else for that matter, by all means, go ahead and try it. W what I'm advocating for is don't believe that it's anything special in and of itself. Mm, right. If you want to try it and it sounds cool, great. <laughs> yeah, it's just yeah. a different tone. But yeah, proponents of 432 it. say that it has some sort of more harmonious and, and healthier, you know, spiritual connection than 440. Yeah. Hard to prove that. Uh, just speaking of Prince again, he promoted a concert where he said he would play his songs in 432, but oh, I don't really? know if he ever, he ever did. I think it was just to get attention. <laughs> and apparently Miles <laughs> said he's he did it so he can sell well. an NFT. Um, <laughs> it would be great to have our um, listeners, if you've actually done any piece, like you know, a traditional song or a composition in like a different uh, tuning system, like 432 or a different scale system, like even tempered or, or uh, was it true? Is it? No, it's not even tempered. What there's, is the there's, other one? There's just, there's the there's just quarter, quarter, quarter comma mean it's Pythagorean. There's a whole bunch and, of them. There's, yeah, yeah there's there to hear it. many, so, many. So mm -hmm. please send them in because we'd love to hear that. Uh, we, we referenced this on the show um, a, a few weeks ago, and I, I actually did a, a YouTube on it as well, about the Lima Global Tuning System. Mm -hmm. And the first step when you enter that, that website is you pick your reference pitch. It defaults to A equals 440, but you can choose any reference pitch you want, and then you pick your scale. And you can even go with like the Western equal temperament scale, where you can go with an African, Indian, Persian, uh, Chinese scale, whatever you want to do. Um, and that, but that, that, that's just playing with the intervals within the octave, but where that octave is placed is your reference pitch. So even if you're a MIDI based musician, you can still do this. Um, you know, you don't have to detune strings or anything like that. You can go, you can use this Lima global tuning system and just play with a different reference pitch and it'll affect all your MIDI recordings um, that you do. So do, it's possible for anybody. Do different cultures yeah. have different reference pitches? Because I know A440 is a, uh, is a Western um, standard, but I mean, do does the Indian uh, music system have a different reference pitch? Or? It, 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 for sure it did, like you know, hundreds of years ago, whatever. But again, as instrument makers export their products worldwide and they're all tuned to A440, people tend to pick up A440 as as a as a standard. And and in in the 50s or whenever it was established, it was the international organized standardization. Right. Yeah. right. So it was supposed to be adopted uh worldwide. And and yeah, if you if you go buy a guitar in India or China right now, chances are it's tuned A four forty. And and if we're talking about traditional music, um, yeah. there, um, I mean Indian music tends not to not to be polyphonic. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's 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 a melodic improvisation on a on a drone, so they wouldn't have the same sort of same sort of issues. It would seem that we, I mean, we get, we get into all these issues with um, tuning systems and this is beyond obviously 432 versus 440. That's, this is, this is about tuning systems itself. Um, the different tuning systems uh, will sound very different for different types of, 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 uh, of harmonies. Uh, when we had the Pythagorean, uh, Pythagorean tuning, uh, back then things like major and minor thirds were considered dissonances and and 
and really part of it was because they were they were tuned differently. They weren't as sweet as they as they were under uh, quarter common common mean, I believe. Uh, and so a lot of this is, is 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 us trying to figure out, hey, what how what if what if what if we want to play with with thirds. Mm. Uh, what, with, with, a, with an unfixed pitch instrument like a violin, you can you can adjust all those things on the fly by merely moving your finger a little bit forward, a little bit back. So you can you can say, hey, this this actually this interval sounds actually kind of sweet if we play it like this. And then a lot of the the tuning uh, probably followed uh, to, to justify these these new discoveries. And hey, what, what let's try these new sonorities out. We wouldn't we wouldn't have. We wouldn't have jazz. We wouldn't have chromatic music with the Fagorian mm. tuning. Mm. Um, it would sound very, or it would be a very different aesthetic. Mm. Yeah, the Greeks weren't really big on jazz, you know. Uh, that's <laughs> well, really not the ancient were Greeks, anyway. Not the ancient Greeks. No, they no. were. Uh, they, said, they said it sounded like a it sound like a bunch of mistakes. Yeah, <laughs> okay, I've got a question for you, for, you, for you, Matt. If you're able, is to that on the bases? What's it? Yeah, what's that new? Uh, question for you, if you're able to answer it. Can you describe what the difference is between equal temperament and just intonation? Um, no, not a not on a not on a napkin. Uh, no. it, it's it's the way they the Pythagorean, uh, if I remember correctly, measures it in terms of fifths. So they try to get these this ratio of, of fifths perfect from, from C to G, mm. to, uh, G to D, uh, et, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and as a result, there's, there's uh, more or less spacing between, between the thirds. So as, as, we, as we move through the cycle, some of the, the thirds become more and more, or, more or less pleasant to hear. Right. And I believe with, with just, it was, uh, and again, I'm, You'll have you'll have to look at this all up. It's been a long time since I've <laughs> I've studied this. Uh, it, it, it's, it is to do more with the overtone series, I believe. Right. Uh, um, tuning those uh, from 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 octave to fifth to next octave to third to fifth to octave, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Oh, right. And. Um, so the Pythagorean music uh, tuning would have sounded lovely for for those perfect fifths in, in medieval music, where the, the fourths and fifths were con considered the, and yeah. octaves were considered the, uh, the most harmonious. Yes, but not at all for for playing Bach or playing pop music today. No, so it so very back, different. So back then, if they if they, with their tuning systems, if they tried to play thirds, it would sound very um, dissonant. And it, it was it was until equal temperament came along that thirds started sounding more relatively harmonious. Is that off the top of my head? I, I probably not entire, entirely. There there might have been. Ugh. And again, don't take take everything Uncle Matt says with a grain of salt here. But <laughs> but but part of part of it was was teachings of the, of the church as well. Part of yeah. it may have had had to have done with the sensuous nature of, of thirds. But certainly part of it, mm. when playing when playing an organ, uh, you could rationalize, hey, these 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 this uh, interval doesn't sound as as sweet mm. as this interval based on that tuning system. There, there was that there was that great podcast, the Phil the Phil you actually uh, forwarded me this one, the the BBC's History of Music, mm. and he goes through from like starting with Gregorian chants. They're all like five minutes long. These episodes are really digestible, great. and and he goes through and and reaches the point where they started introducing thirds because before yeah they were considered evil they were too sexy right <laughs> he's too sexy <laughs> he's, he's too, too sexy, sexy for god and <laughs> and 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 that was really the pivot point for western music because like perfect fourths and fifths are pretty universal like they exist hmm. all over the world yeah. but when you get into thirds and sevenths and things that's where tuning systems really differentiate culture to culture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah yeah and of course uh, I think one of the composers that start, started to first that first started to work with uh, thirds is a composer named Dunstable that's and right his music is beautiful yeah. and if you, if you yeah. find his his work and it's just it's it's wonderful it's uh, mm, yeah. it, it's kind of medieval but not quite it's really really beautiful it's bridging that gap between medieval and, and uh, early renaissance certainly in fact, Dunstable was the first time I had heard it. Was actually on that BBC uh, series. Mm. So, 
It yeah. would be an interesting thing to try um, this 432 tuning on the guitar, but of course, guitars um, can often be, uh, they need to have intonation done between, you know, the uh, the nut and the bridge, you know, they need to be kind of adjusted a bit to sound in tune. So oh. if you do try to uh, go down to 432, your intonation may be out a bit, so... Um, oh. You so know. if it was in tune and perfectly set up for 440, if you tuned it down to 432, it might not sound good all the way up the neck? Is that what you're saying? It's quite possible. I've heard that people who, there are some people who like to um, uh, tune and drop D, I think. And yes. So yes. your low E is not, uh, the low E, it's actually a low D for, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. kind of sludgy music, I guess. Yeah. You know, the kids. Slide. You know, the it's kids good for slide, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but... Um, uh, recording people always say that if you're going to be recording in drop D, make sure you take it to the store or your guitar tech and say, I tune in drop D because your guitar has to be set up in a different kind of way. Mm. So the intonation needs to be set for that. So um, Does that hmm. count for any alternative tuning? Like if you do dadgad or whatever, do you have to adjust the intonation? Like, or should you theoretically? Um, Probably a little bit. I mean, it's... It depends on how much, how far you go off. Um, mm. But I mean, guitars are out of tune just by their very nature. I mean, they're yes, they are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The instant they're tuned, they start going and, out of tune. Yeah, well, they instantly start to go flat. They 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 want to naturally head back towards four thirty two from yeah. four forty. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and of course, the, the other, and, and beyond. Yeah, the other way to play the other way to play with this, of course, because we have such amazing digital technology at our fingertips, is you can record a guitar part in 440, detune it digitally to 432, and then mm. sing over that. Absolutely, or do whatever you can. Yeah. Like there are ways to experiment with this without, you know, having to rejig your rejig your instrument necessarily. How about your keyboard, um, uh, Neil? Does it do uh, even temperament uh, scales? Yeah, they, well, again, with the Lima Global Tuning System, you can you can uh, play with those different scales. There are it depends on your plugin, mm-hmm. and and your and the your sound source. So some like piano plugins actually do alternate scales and and detuning. Um, I'm pretty sure in Native Instruments Contact there is there is like a tuning. That's um, correct. You knob can, you can play with all those all yes. those temperaments. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you, which is, which is great for world instrument or trying, you know, just trying to get a different type of sound. Uh-huh. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, it's, it's, no, no, here, here's the other question, though. If you're working with, like, an opera singer who's used to doing 440 and then you do a piece in 428 or 432 or something like that, is that going to throw off the singer if they're so used to singing in a certain um, relative pitch? It could. It could, it could throw off everybody else in the orchestra too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, for sure. well, well, that's sort of the point of 440 standard tuning is that you can move around and go play with a different orchestra, and everyone's still in the same tune or same well, key. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That was sort of the idea of standardizing it. Yeah. But if you so. play, I played a big practical joke on an opera singer and brought it all down, um, and again, e- even even in. in I, I, I've noticed this even at Second City with people who, who sang the same, uh, would sing the same tune day after day, or, or sang a tune before. They they would know they would have an inkling that the the pitch was was off because it wouldn't feel the same way in their throat. They wouldn't feel mm-hmm. that same physical tension mm-hmm. in their throat. Yeah. Um, well, that that's flat. Yeah, I How do you? Sorry, yeah, I noticed that. And I'm like, I was just gonna say, I noticed that just playing. Like, if I haven't tuned my guitar in a while and I start playing and singing, I got no, that's out. Like, right. you can tell when you have any kind of familiar. I think when you have any kind of familiarity with the songs that you're playing, as soon as some, because you, as you say, you feel the tension or the lack of tension or whatever. Like, it just doesn't mm-hmm. feel right in your mouth when you're mm-hmm. singing if it's even slightly out. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, an opera singer memory. would be. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That the opera singer would be Andy in a flash if you try yeah. that. Little <laughs> well, and and, and 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 again, historically, that's that's been the case with this with this whole tuning standard thing. Is that as I push the pitches higher, you just you know retune your violin and you're good to go. But the singers, they would feel differently, right? Right. Right. Mm-hmm. 
I can't, not, I can't sing in that key. There's not a switch on the human body that says, no. go to this reference page. No. <laughs> and, you know, and it, 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 it reflects itself today in, in the, in the, even a broader sense. Like, I, I can't sing in that key. Uh, you, you have to bring it down like a full, yes. a full semitone. Like, no, I can't do it in A. you got to do it in A flat. That's, that's mm -hmm. too high or that's too low or whatever. Yeah. And, and it's all really, about the, the quality of the voice. Dictated by what the highest note in the melody is. That's right. Or the lowest note, for that matter. Or lowest note. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I think I may have told this story before, but I was in a band where the singer was constantly moving stuff around um, half steps, half mm -hmm. step up, half step down, back to mm -hmm. where we started. And then one day, one of the shows that we were playing in front of a pretty full house, uh, we started playing this song. And one of these songs that we had moved around, you know, tons of times. And I was playing in, I think I was playing in G and the keyboard was playing in G sharp and the bass player was playing in G flat. And it just sounded like people were murdering cats. So we had to stop actually on stage to figure out what the hell we were doing. Uh, <laughs> somebody pick just, a key. Uh, yeah, it was because okay, what key are we doing this in now? Because so when you do change keys, just be considerate of your musicians. I'll get confused. Mm -hmm. Or just call and it jazz. the audience. <laughs> Although someone actually the audience, came talk to the audience. This is always death. <laughs> well, the, the, the other thing I'm kind of wondering just out loud here is that, like, what about atonal music, like Philip Glass and all those guys? Like, how do, like, are they playing around with tunings? Are they playing around with? Well, so, so, yeah, certainly composers have, and and they've tried to bring. Um, when did it start in in 20th century avant garde mu music uh, mm. with with micro with micro tunes, micro, mm. uh, quarter tone music. Uh, I, I don't know if it started around uh, bar talk or earlier, maybe in the 1920s, maybe a little bit earlier, but certainly it's been mm. played with again. And 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 I know some co contemporary composers now are, are 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 fascinated by alternate tuning systems. Again, mm. not not 432 versus 440 standard pitch, but we're actually talking about different uh, tuning systems. Right. So, and by tuning systems, uh, we always mention the that's a space between notes so the intervals know, yeah yeah so yes. maybe in different intervals the space between c and um uh c and g would be a bit a bit wider a bit smaller or you know c and um e i guess would be the third that would be a little bit different mm -hmm. um so, so uh, just so let, let me just catch up, and maybe this is something different than what we were talking about. So the difference between four forty and four thirty two is the the uh, the A is tuned to different. I think that's the, the where it's based off, mm -hmm. but still the difference between all the notes is still the same. It's just that's down correct. or up. That's yeah. correct. So so, but a tonality. What you were talking about, Phil, where the the intervals between the notes change? What is that something different? That's a tuning system. So you have um, just tuning where things were tuned to usually to the key of C and all the intervals were perfect and beautiful. But um, if you had to do the, so the song in C sharp, for instance, it would sound totally off. And mm -hmm. uh, even temper uh, tuning means that everything is kind of a bit more perfectly um, divided. So... Mm -hmm you have a little bit more, it's a bit more easy to go between keys, raising, lowering stuff without it sounding horribly different. Now, does that have anything to do with flats and sharps or is yes. that a whole other thing? Okay, so, yep. so yep. C, which has no flats or sharps, is one thing, but then if you start changing it, you push it into an area where it there are now- It starts to get more and more out of, it'll start to get more and more out of tune using different uh, uh, tuning systems. Yeah, even even playing playing box uh, first prelude in the well tempered clavier, um, it modulates to areas where even if you're playing if you, if you take that that key of C and you tune it perfectly to C, once you start to mod modulate away from C, mm -hmm. and I can't remember exactly where it happens, but there's there's parts where oh this is getting a, this is getting a little funky sounding mm -hmm. because he's getting a little bit too far from the home key and he's getting into those areas where the tuning. You can you can really start to hear those imperfections, but not if you're using equal temperament. Is that deliberate uh, uh, on the composer's part, or is that something that is the players you have to compensate for, or is it deliberate in the score? It's del it's deliberate it, it, in a sense. It makes a it makes a case for this more uh, equal tempered system. 
so the, the, the system, the more archaic systems, this new type of music would not even have been possible in any sort of fixed pitch instrument. Right. It would just it would just sound like what 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 is happening here? Where are you going? Yeah. Uh, you would you would stay very safe within a, a certain uh, number of chords. You know, one one four five would be would be safe. Yeah, like, like one one six one six one six four two five would be very safe. But yeah. modulating uh, would would get into danger zones. Well, it, it's sort of like harmonicas, right? Like harmonicas come in different keys. I'm not, I'm yes. not sure about the, the physics of it or the technology of it, but mm -hmm. it's sort of like old instruments. Like they work in a in a particular scale or a particular mode or whatever. But Like saxophones. But but yeah, but you can't, well, even with saxophones, like you you have access to all 12 notes kind of thing, right? But you can't, you can't like, like Matt is saying, you can't, introduce a modulation in the middle of your piece and continue on the same instrument without it starting to sound really weird yeah. with with an older tuning system which which yeah. the which these equal tuning systems uh allowed us to do so now we can now we can modulate freely we can we can go from c major and make our way to f sharp major and, and the, the the f sharp major chord doesn't sound any different from the c sharp from the C major chord, except for the relationship between C major and F sharp major, the, the context of hey, now now we're now we're somewhere else. But you wouldn't say, oh, that that has that chord has a completely different flavor because the tuning between F sharp and A sharp and C sharp is a little bit different than the tuning between C and E and G. So they would still sound like like major triads. They wouldn't mm -hmm. sound like, oh, this is a major triad, and that's a that's a that's a funkier sounding major major yeah. triad. Yeah. There, there, there's a really great YouTube, I think it was Adam Neely again, who did a good explainer on why do we have 12 notes in our octave? Mm, <laughs> and that's true. You know, did like a good 15 minute thing on that. Cause you know, like 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 it's it, I've heard this before. I don't know if you can ruminate on this, Matt, is F sharp and G flat are not actually the same note, true or false. Well, again, it depends on the type of instrument you're playing. If it's if it's fixed pit, pitch, then necessarily they are. Uh, but given given context, if you're playing a, a string instrument or if you're singing, you might adjust your your G flat or your F sharp depending on what key you're in. Mm -hmm. you, and and it might be, you know, if you, if you're if you're playing if you're playing your G flat, resolving to F in the key of D flat major, it might have a different a different quality than an F sharp leading to G in the key of G. But but in that case, you're you're singing the F sharp or G flat a little bit. Sharp you, you're little you're, bit sing, you're singing yeah, or, or if you're playing your your violin, for example, where but where but you're not. You're, but theoretically, they are literally the same thing. In a fixed in, a fixed pitch instrument like a piano, they they are going to be exactly the same thing. Hmm. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, you because if you if you hit if you hit if you hit F sharp in the in the key of in the key of G, it's going to sound the same as if you're hitting, and someone's put put that down as as a a G flat. It's going to sound the exact same way if you hit that that pitch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's also different. It's also different. I think if um, when you're doing choral choral or you know um, if it's just strings. I mean, you have that sort of um, you know they can really tune things with the with the ear, whereas a piano, it's you know F sharp and um, and G flat. They are the physically the exact same thing. Yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. True that. And it's well, also what, what, what would you say on that, Neil? What was um, where were you going from? Well, I'm 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 a piano player, and I'm very much I'm kind of rigid in my twelve note <laughs> equal temperament <laughs> thing, right? So to me, they were always the same. So when I heard that, I remember sure. seeing, it must have been a social media post or something where someone was talking about it. It's like, no, they're not actually the same thing, but maybe, but you're right. Maybe they were talking about in the context of a vocal or in the context of another non-fixed pitched instrument. I think I, ideally, I, I mean, they, they would be the same. And, and on mm -hmm. paper, they should be the same. But maybe when when, when performing, one might perform mm -hmm. them a little bit yeah, differently. Yeah, certainly. certainly. And certainly, and certainly with a voice. Yeah. Yes, one can perfectly reproduce those those pitches every time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you'll yeah. even hear. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry to ramble on. I'm rambling a lot in this one. 
Uh, it must it must be very exciting. Um, <laughs> you'll you'll find you'll find sometimes in a cappella music how uh, or, or singing an a cappella line you start in one pitch and and you're you're singing you know could be singing it that you like row row your bo- row your boat and you might end up in the completely different key. Oh, um, yeah, it's my nature of singing it because mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> you don't have that fixed pitch to go to go by. Yeah, yeah. It's a fascinating um, thing to explore as as songwriters to, you know, see if you can download a or, or set your keyboard to just intonation because that's I think the easiest um, thing to explore and just play stuff in C and see what it does to your ear mm-hmm. and just as a way of exploring it and 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 change your reference period you know your reference tones to four thirty two and see if it does anything for you and it may yeah. not you know test it out on our chakras. Yeah, and I mean, it's... I've been tuning my guitar to the car alarm outside, and it's been really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Your flat <laughs> car alarm. <laughs> Get on that. Yeah. Well, at least when you play, you won't um, you won't interfere with it, right? It'll be perfectly in tune with the car alarm. Well, I get the resonance, and I'll keep setting it off. Yeah. Yeah. That too. <laughs> Okay, I think on that note, um, uh, we'll wrap this up. <laughs> did, yes, we, did we do that? Did, did yeah, we, did, we can do that. We did a full hour on this. We did a full hour. <laughs> That's what all the time we have. This was a deep dive. This was a really deep dive. We, sometimes, like water beetles, we skitter across the surface of pop music, and sometimes we're down... Uh, down in the, the trenches. Free, what's that? Free breath? Free holding? What's that? You know, the free divers, where they, they hold their breath for five minutes. Oh, I don't know. I thought you were talking about spelunking. No. (laughs) That's caves. Anyway. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) yeah. Anyway, special thanks to Matt Reed and your big musical brain. Thank you so much for joining us, Matt. Uh, Thank you with a grain of salt from Uncle Matt. (laughs) Uncle Matt, where can our listeners find out more about you, Matt? Uh, You can find me online, matthewcreed.com. Cool. Yeah. All right. And uh, we want to hear from you, our listeners. So please send us your comments on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Song Talk Radio, or send us an email at feedback at songtalk.ca. Let us know if you've tried an alternate tuning and what it's done for you. Also, be sure to check out our YouTube channel for live performance videos and full episodes now that we're all in these little virtual boxes. Subscribe today to the Song Talk Radio podcast on your favorite podcast provider. And don't forget to sign up for our free newsletter at songtalk.ca. It comes out about once a month-ish. Um, you'll find links to all the products, books, and web services we mentioned on the show on our resources page on the website. And wherever you are in the world, please join us at our next monthly Song Talk meetup online. It's free to join on meetup.com and free to attend the meetup. Stop by songtalk.ca for the link. You can follow me at neilmodi.com. You can follow Phil at philemory.ca. And you can follow Michael. Proudfoot420 on Instagram. And Matt, once again, your favorite social media channel is? MatthewCReed.com. <laughs> the website, always good. <laughs> no matter what social media channels come and go, the website will always be there. <laughs> that's, that's king. Uh, thanks for listening, everyone. Be sure to drop by the website songtalk.ca to browse past shows and find out how you can be a guest. Stay safe, everyone, and keep on writing no matter what tuning system you use. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. Stay safe. <laughs> and scene. Thank you, oh, gentlemen. Matt, so is that is that a fake background, or do you just have a very nice tapestry in your you house? Tell me the way his well, headphones I'm, keep I'm, disappearing. I, I, I'm yeah. in France. I'm in France. <laughs> oh, okay, good. All right. I uh, I regret we didn't get to. It was a perfect opportunity opportunity to try to talk about the brown tone too. Wouldn't it have been oh, brown tone? Oh yeah, or the danger. <laughs> to the what? The uh, is that seven uh, hertz? The one that's actually deadly. I don't know. Deadly yeah, the t- seven hertz is supposed to be an actually a lethal note. Seven. You can't even hear seven hertz. No, it's silent, but it will. It's a silent disrupt. killer. A low frequency your, oscillator. Yeah, exactly. Earthquake. Where do we stop hearing? Like at 180 20, or 116? 20. Uh, 20, what was it? So 20, 20 to 20,000. Oh, I mean, hearing range, yeah. 20 to 20,000. Okay. Yeah. I've a bass guitar, the low range, E on a bass guitar is crazy.
the low E on a bass guitar is 40 hertz. Oh, okay. Mm. Well, we can go way lower than that. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I've got pretty good high frequency, and it drives me crazy because I can hear all the little <laughs> electronic beeps for like <laughs> from people next door and stuff. Ah, oh, it's fucking. Wow. What, yeah, what, what, what's the brown tone, though? What's the brown tone? That's the one that makes you fit your pants. Yeah. <laughs> Some kind of crazy resonance happening. Yeah. Yeah. But if it's in it, if, you, if it's in 432, that's true. It'll, it'll make it'll make you suck the shit back into you. Oh <laughs> yes, that's always good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I see. Um, yes, it, it's supposed to be between five and nine hertz, but okay. it's it's mythical. It's never been actually pr tested mm -hmm. and, and no. worked. No, no. Because everybody's bodies have to resonate at different, like your bones would resonate at a different frequency than, you know, your fat or your muscle or your teeth or and you person know, to person. It's going to change. We're too. not com yeah, exactly. We're not comprised of one uh, substance. No. That's why when you build bridges, you make them out of different uh, densities and different substances. Because you can go online and you can see bridges that buckle when the wind is the oh, same yeah. frequency as the metal. Right. Mm. Yeah, it's there's some pretty scary videos out, out there about that. <laughs> well, fascinating. Oh, so stuff. MythBusters tried to tried to test the brown tone, and uh, they Did were they? unable to. Yeah, they couldn't reproduce it. No, they, they got they got twenty decibels. They got twenty decibels at nine hertz. Still wow. Nothing. So, test subjects all reported some physical anxiety and shortness yeah. of breath <laughs> and a small amount of nausea, but uh, this was dismissed by the hosts. Uh, so they say it's bullshit. There we go. <laughs> did, did, the, did the test subjects know what they were being subjected to? That's true. They just yeah. thought it was Kenny G. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a violation of the Geneva, Geneva Convention, so they couldn't do yes. that. Kenny, Kenny Geneva. Can you, is that what the G stands for? Yeah, that, that is. Yeah. I, 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 oh God, I actually forgot. My one of my conductor friends was very close friend. I've got to ask him about that, or maybe I can just look it up. What the G stands because he he was he was with him when he got the nickname originally. Oh really? Oh, oh really? The Kenny G. Mm. Maybe it's He's just the last name. He's a uh, fantastic golfer and quite a pilot. I can I can imagine. And mm -hmm. to be honest, a very successful musician. So he can play the saxophone. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I think he's it's still sleeping threat. on a pile of money. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. Quite comfortably. But Jesus Christ, it's dreadful music. <laughs> That's true. I used to really like him when I was a lot younger. Then I got a load of what John Zorn was up to. And I was like, this would make mm. Kenny G's head explode. <laughs> yeah, it's just un it's just unadventurous. I mean, you know, yeah. it's just, I mean, there's a lot of musicians out there that make bland, yeah. comforting music. Mm -hmm. He just happened to make a lot of fucking money at it. That's true. Well, you there's, see, I've, I've always made a point of not doing that, and I've not made any money. So, you know. So there you go. <laughs> you can find that magic with... formula loops that pleases everybody, or you can find that one niche and get them all. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've my successfully niche avoided both. <laughs> <laughs> So, going so the key then, Michael, is to find the average of the two, and that's the sweet spot. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the sweet spot. That's the brown tone. <laughs> that's the brown of the tones. That's, yeah, exactly. That's that, the that, color of brown. No, that's, the, that's the green tone. <laughs> the green tone. <laughs> well, well, if you eat a lot of kale. All right, Lance. Play this court and people just mail you money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, guys. All right, gentlemen. Great, Thanks, great show. Great to Good see, to see you your again, faces. Man. Good to see your faces. Yeah, and yeah, everyone's got slightly longer hair, so we're all looking oh, a little oh, more rock and roll. Yeah. Yeah. My uh, hair is no. completely out of tune. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me again. Yeah, thanks I for coming. I hope to see you all, to see see you all in, in person again uh, soonish. Sooner yes. than later. Yes, so. that, that would be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. And we'll have a drink. For sure. Like in the old days. Good night. Take care. Proper people. Good night. Cheers.